Orwell is famous for his searching and uh, sardonic critique of the way thought is controlled by force uh, under totalitarian dystopia. But much less is not known is his discussion of how similar outcomes are achieved in free societies. He's speaking, of course, of England, and he wrote that although the country is quite free, uh, nevertheless, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Gave a couple of examples, provided a few words of explanation, which were to the point. One particularly pertinent comment was his observation on a quality education in the best schools, where it is instilled into you that there are certain things that it simply wouldn't do to say, or we may add even to think. Uh, one reason why not much attention is paid to this essay is that it wasn't published. It was found decades later in his unpublished papers. It was intended as the introduction to his famous animal farm, bitter satire of Stalinist totalitarianism. Uh, why it wasn't published is apparently unknown, but uh, I think perhaps you can speculate. Descriptions of it, although he didn't understand what was going on. It's George Orwell. He had no idea what was going on, but he wrote, he was writing from the point of view of the prune militia, you know, kind of semi Trotskyite militia, and that's what he saw. So he didn't understand the anarchists at all. You know, and, um, but he gave a very vivid portrayal of what it was like. So he'd never seen anything like that. You know, go through Barcelona, nobody's calling it even sir, you know, people are comrades. There's no hierarchy of people are participating. So I don't understand what it was. You know, a lot of things I don't like, but it's something you just have to appreciate. You know, came back a couple months later, and then he said, it's totally different. You know, you're back to the bowing and scraping and the orders of Stalinist communist leadership that taken over to crush the revolution. It was in the process of crushing the revolution with the support of the West and you know, the support of Franco. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, even from his skewed perspective, just as a perceptive human being, he saw something really important was happening here. I didn't think that 1984 was one of Orwell's right. best words. To tell you the truth, I could barely finish it. <laughs> right. I thought it was kind of obvious and wooden, you know, you know where it's going. You know, he had some nice comments about Newspeak and this and right. that, but it was good, useful phrases. But uh, I didn't think it was much of a book. So what does it mean to be a liberal or a communist or anything else? I mean, the uh, you know, point that Orwell made, I mean, the uh, uh, one way of trying to uh, uh, undermine independent thought and uh, uh, creative approaches to the world is to simply d uh, destroy the way of talking about things. So the, wor the words literally almost have no meaning. In fact, by now, just about every word has that's used in political discourse has at least two meanings, uh, a literal meaning and its opposite. And it's the opposite that's normally used. And so uh, take, take a contemporary debate that's going on right now. Uh, you, you see uh, uh, headlines in newspapers about a report on uh, uh, foreign fighters in Iraq. Uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, announces that she's got a, that there's an easy, asked a question about how can we settle the problem in Iraq, so it's quite easy. Just keep the foreign fighters out, keep the foreign weapons out, and it'll all be settled. And you know, nobody bats an eyelash. Are there 150,000 U.S. troops there? I mean, are they bringing in weapons? They're not foreign, uh, because anything we do is not foreign. If we invaded Canada, uh, they would be enemy combatants, uh, and we would be there by right. Uh, so the concept of concepts like aggression, invasion, terror, uh, anything you mentioned does, doesn't exist. I mean, take, take democracy. Uh, George Bush was in uh, Egypt yesterday uh, praising President Mubarak. I mean, Egyptians are writhing at, at the same time he's giving talks about how we have to promote democracy and so on. I mean, they just come from Saudi Arabia, the most extreme, uh, one of the most extreme fundamentalist territories in the world. Uh, you know, uh, 
see a picture of him with uh, King Abdullah watching a horse show and so on and so forth. I mean, well, what are we to make of all of this? Uh, the terms for discussing things have been almost evacuated of content. It actually comes from Orwell, who made a distinction between what he called people and unpeople. Uh, people are those who count. Unpeople are those who are th they're not human. You can do anything to them you like. Actually, that uh, came up uh, uh, to me vividly a couple of hours ago. I happened to be in a video conference in London, and uh, uh, the, the moderator of the group there, one of the questions he asked, he pointed, he just he brought up the uh, horror in the West over the uh, beheadings that are taking place. The beheadings of journalists. There was another one in Algeria uh, a day or two ago. And he said, this is creating such extraordinary outrage in the West that we just have to do something about it. And he said, bad is, this is a pretty liberal group. He said, bad, we, we recognize that U.S., uh, British, Israeli atrocities are pretty awful. Uh, but even during the Israeli attack on Gaza, I mean, you didn't see things like beheadings, didn't you? In fact, during the Israeli attack on Gaza, if you look at the sectors of Gaza that were subject to really vicious murderous attack, like Shufaya, uh, after the attack kind of relented, uh, people went in and were picking up pieces of bodies to try to identify who, who was murdered. Uh, all of that was reported. But he was correct. That didn't horrify the West. Uh, when we carry out atrocities like uh, smashing people up uh, so that they're body parts are scattered around and you can't even identify who they were, that's not a crime. It can be a mistake. You're sometimes allowed to say it's a mistake. It's just like the drone assassination campaign, which undoubtedly does worse things than beheading to its victims. It's a mistake. Maybe it's a mistake, but it's not a crime. On the other hand, if uh, ISIS or whatever offshoot it is in Algeria beheads people, that offends us to the heavens. And it is horrendous, undoubtedly, though it's a tiny fraction of what we and our clients do. But that's the people on people distinction. There's a relatively small number, almost infinitesimal, uh, of people who um, fulfill the responsibility of intellectuals. They use their, their credibility, they use their, their, their access, they use their tools, etc., etc., to try and uh, discuss reality in a way that actually is consistent with human well-being and consistency and so on. Then we have virtually everybody who has those attributes, who has those advantages, who um, is capable of understanding when it serves their interests. So they'll, they'll search far and wide for something about somebody who they wish to prosecute, um, but is completely incapable, as you describe it, even incapable of hearing the words when it's contrary to this background of interest. Okay, now it might not matter because the fact is the crucial thing. But lots and lots of people hear that and the, and the way that they dismiss it is to say it can't be because what would explain it? Why would all those people behave in such a way? How could they possibly have the mental capacity to see the truth and not see the truth? Not, you know, it must be the small number of people who are confused, not the large number of people. Um, how do you answer that? Actually, Orwell had a word for it. He called it double think. Mm -hmm. A double think is the capacity to hold two contradictory ideas in mind and believe them both. Uh, that's practically a defining characteristic of uh, intellectual history. Uh, secondly, it is not, I'm not talking about the United States. As far as I know, this is close to historically universal. No, no, I find very few exceptions. And furthermore, it goes back to the earliest recorded history. Uh, uh, furthermore, every person who asks this question knows the answer. All they have to do is look at themselves. Uh, how many people have failed to go through an experience like, uh, for example, when you're you know, six years old and uh, uh, your little brother takes a toy and... Uh, you want the toy and your mother's not looking and you're bigger than he is so you grab the toy and then the kid starts yelling and your mother comes in and she starts uh, uh, censuring you for taking the toy and how do you answer you say yeah i took the toy because i wanted it and he's smaller than me 
where he'd say, look, he didn't want the toy anyway, and besides it was mine, and uh, he really stole it from me, uh, so I was right. In other words, can you know anybody? Answer, can you know who, who anybody who hasn't gone through such experiences in their life? And you get so the answer, not the first. Yeah, so we all know the answer to the question. Right. Uh, you, there are ways, uh, easy ways, to rationalize whatever happens in a usually complicated world, so as to protect yourself. Furthermore, the fact that intellectuals act like this is close to tautology. You don't become a respected yeah, intellectual unless you do this kind of thing, not, you know, through, not like Kissinger, just servility of the master, uh, but because you internalize it. 